This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning to Emory Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our visiting speaker this morning, uh, Jeff Coven. And uh, it's really wonderful to welcome Jeff home to Emory, where he graduated from the School of Medicine here 25 years ago. He was class president. And Jeff is a, an example of how we have uh, a lot of Emory blood in the ACC national leadership. Before coming to Emory, Jeff uh, was an undergrad at University of Michigan where he was a varsity swimmer. And then uh, after graduating from Emory, he's had a really busy 25 years. 24 of those he spent at Tufts and had uh, really, he was a force at Tufts. I, I looked at his resume last night. Uh, Jeff was fellowship director for 17 years, director of the vascular function lab, associate chief of cardiology, chief medical officer for graduate medical education, he won numerous teaching awards, had uh, an impressive research career, and uh, as far as national service, Jeff has uh, really contributed significantly to both the American Heart Association and the ACC. He serves presently as the current chair of ACC annual scientific sessions, and then this past year took over as chief of the section of cardiovascular medicine, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. And Jeff's going to talk to us this morning about redefining cardiovascular education and competency. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks very much, Larry. It's really, it is a pleasure to come home. I started my career here 29 years ago, and uh, some of my classmates are even here to join me. So um, as this cartoon says, well, you see, I went to one of those progressive medical schools with no formal classes or credits, and the students planned their course of study. So I never learned anything about the heart, lungs, breathing, and all that. And as uh, Larry mentioned, I did come here to Emory Medical School. So this is what our class looked like uh, 25 years ago on the WISCAB steps. I think they had color photographs by then, but this was at least in black and white. Uh, 110 students, and this was the leadership then. Dean Hout, I think Joel Filner is still in his position, uh, Jonas Schulman, who was a personal mentor of mine, and of course, John Stone, the Dean of Admissions. And then this is how we practiced medicine. I assume Harvey is still here with us. Uh, and uh, we had a good time and, and learned a lot of cardiovascular disease, that's There's for sure. Saul, yeah. Actually, yeah, so, there you are, Saul. <laughs> so it's really, it's really a pleasure to be back. Uh, and I thought that we'd spend the next 50 minutes or so talking about stuff that we think a lot about at the American College of Cardiology and hopefully touches everyone in this room. I know Spencer's been very involved in the ACC, as have, have a lot of you. So we'll talk a little bit about the redefinition of cardiovascular education, focusing on fellowship and then lifelong learning, and then talk about how we define and then how we follow this idea of competency. So this is the outline. And for a long time, this is how we assess competency. Trust me, I went to medical school, I did some training, trust me, I'm a doctor. But is this indeed the best way as to how we should define competency today? When you go to the doctor, is this what you want to hear? Don't worry, I went to school, I did my training, therefore I am competent. So let's talk about what is competency, and then we'll go through competency in the evaluation uh, that we have at this point. So what is competency? Competence is the ability to do something well, a standardized requirement for an individual to properly perform a specific job, encompassing a combination of knowledge, skills, and attitude. So how do we look about physician competence? Well, if you think about it, it's a, it's an, it's a very large world of physician competence. We have medical school, we have our training, we have certification, at least through cardiology, it's through the ABIM. We have societies who deem us competent in a way. We have the six ACGME, or American Board of Medical Specialty competencies. And of course, importantly, our patients tell us if we're competent or not. Our hospitals tell us or put a seal of approval to say we're competent. And of course, our local boards and state uh, certification is claiming competence or not. And then of course, how do we maintain competency over the course of our lifetime? And where should we maintain competency? In everything that we learned in fellowship, or should we concentrate that competency? And that's the stuff I want to go over today. 
So if you think about what it is in the foundation of clinical competence, first of all, it's what you know. It's what you learned in medical school. It's the facts that you've gathered. And then it's how you interpret or imply this, the knows how. So you've developed the knowledge, then you interpret it, and then you show it. You demonstrate it on the wards, you demonstrate it to your patients, and ultimately, you integrate it into practice. And if you really are confident, then you can actually teach it. And you need the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to utilize this knowledge and integration to become a novice, and then move up the ranks to become an expert. So these are what we call our competencies, as defined by the ACGME and the ABMS. They used to be just for graduate medical education. Now they're integrated into lifelong learning. Everyone certainly knows the first two, medical knowledge and patient care, but you shouldn't forget the other four that are equally important. Practice-based learning and improvement, systems-based practice, professionalism, and how to communicate and intermingle with your colleagues and the world of cardiovascular medicine. So traditional competence, sorry, traditional based education, the education that we grew up with 25 years ago here at Emory, was typically the acquisition of knowledge. The responsible party was the teacher to teach the student. The teacher was also responsible for the content. There was an emphasis on summative evaluation. The tools of assessment were indirect. You were evaluated directly relative to your peers in the classroom. And you finished medical school in four years, or you finished internal medicine in three years, and it was a fixed time. But if you think about what we're moving towards in terms of competency-based education, it's a little bit different. Of course, it's about the acquisition of knowledge, but it's really also about the application of knowledge. The responsible party now is more the learner, and the content is both the teacher as well as the student. There's more of an emphasis on formative evaluation with direct assessment tools. You're assessed relative to objective measures, not necessarily just your peers. And importantly, we shouldn't necessarily say that everyone is competent after X period of time. Some may be competent before, some may need extra training. So we're moving towards a competency-based model for education. So competency in cardiology can be based upon the time spent in training, the number of procedures that one does, examination scores or articles published. This is a bit of an older school model for assessing competency. But it can also differ. It can differ in each individual. It can differ from one training program to another, from one region to another, from one subspecialty to another, and from time to time. What we leave our fellowship training in terms of level of competency may be very different than our level of training 20 or 30 years later. So how does this all begin? We finish medical school, which is fairly time specific and fairly rudimentary in terms of how we uh, assess and how we uh, uh, share knowledge. But in graduate medical ed education, it's a bit different. Larry knows this, Robbie Williams knows this. It's different here at Emory versus Dartmouth versus Tufts versus University of California. So becoming a cardiovascular specialist has become quite a complex uh, scheme, if you will. You go through a lot of years, four years undergraduate medical school training, super training. By the time you're finished, it's about 16 or so years. Does that mean you're competent to practice independently? When you finish training program, the most important document that is signed by the training director says that you are competent to practice cardiovascular medicine independently. What does that mean? Well, this is the complexity of where we are in cardiovascular training today. For those fellows, you understand, obviously, you can choose either general cardiology or a subspecialization. But how do you develop competency in every single one of these areas? At the end of training, four, five, six, or seven years, are you competent to do every single thing that's on this map? Your patients may think you are. The Board of Registration and Medicine may think you are. But truly, are you and do you need to or should you continue to think or practice as if you're competent in all of these areas? So a traditional assessment of competency, in my world, when I, le when I learned, and in many uh, folks who are sitting here, was you see one, you do one, you teach one, you're competent. And our typical tools were based on how long you were training, what the evaluations said about you, 
there were some requirements, national as well as local, and we put a lot of emphasis on how many procedures you did. If you did 150 echoes, you were competent. If you did 10 cardioversions, you were considered competent. So how have we changed that paradigm in graduate medical education, and are we there yet to assess competency in GME? And I'll first focus on GME, and then I'll move towards lifelong learning. So about five years ago, we thought, should there be, or we thought about the idea of putting a, an examination across the United States into fellowship training. We know there are in-training examinations in medicine and others. Is that a reasonable way to assess competency, at least sitting down and taking an examination? So we developed the American College of Cardiology in-training examination. And this was meant to be a competency-based assessment, not only thinking about your knowledge or its application to patient care, but the other competencies as well. And then for the fellowship training director to utilize this as a tool along with their typical tools of evaluations, peer review, observations, et cetera. How many of the fellows in the room have taken the in-training exam <coughs> last week or two weeks ago? Great. So it's pretty much in every, in every program, over 90% of programs are utilizing it. And we developed the ACC in-training examination really to prepare fellows in training for the board examination. So this will look familiar to you. These are the content areas within the ABIM examination. Realizing that this is a multiple choice examination, it's not an, the only way to assess competency, but perhaps a way for the program director and the learner to understand are they, are they evolving in terms of their medical knowledge. And so as you can see here, first year, second year, and third year fellows, there's a stepwise progression. These are means plus or minus standard deviations. Stepwise progression in their knowledge in the individual content areas. So it seemed like at least we were getting a sense from first year to third year, the level of knowledge in these six competencies was evolving. And again, if you look at it more schematically, first year's in blue, second year's in red, third year's in yellow, and these are a bit older data published in 15, that again, there's a stepwise progression. Thankfully, that first year fellows know a little bit less than second year's than a little bit less than third year's. And importantly, this past year, we published that indeed the score on the test, for again, for the fellows here, is somewhat predictive of your score on your cardiology ABIM evaluation. So don't take the FIT in training examination lightly, but it does, and it does somewhat predict your overall score on the ABIM certification so much that if you do reasonably well on the ACC in training evaluation, you have over a 90% chance of passing the ABIM uh, examination after fellowship. So somewhat of a predictive tool, but again, more importantly, a way for training programs to evaluate at least medical knowledge competency as the program is evolving. And what we did in this examination was we actually gave the fellows and the training director feedback. So you haven't gotten it yet, the fellows in the room, but you will get feedback on the questions you missed. So importantly, you will understand that of the 18 questions in arrhythmia, you missed a question on the indications for permanent pacing, CRT, and ICD placement. And the answer was focused on ventricular fibrillation. We can't give the, answer, the questions out. Obviously, these are secure questions. But we can give you feedback and your program feedback in terms of perhaps areas that are, that are knowledge gaps. So the in-training examination, I think, has helped somewhat to evaluate levels of competency and hopefully increasing levels of competency as one increases their years in fellowship training. But there are other tools that I want to point out in GME that have really helped assess levels of competency and understanding that not all learners learn at the same pace and perhaps fellowship training could be lengthened or shortened for certain students. And we're going to focus on these three items. Reporting milestones, which are not unique to cardiology, but, but actually are throughout graduate medical education. The new core cardiovascular training statements, COCATs. And our curricular milestones, which you may not be familiar with, but are really becoming the cornerstone of fellow competency levels. So this all started back in to around 2012 or so, when Tom Naska, the head of graduate medical education across the country, wanted to redefine how we assess competency. 
And his goal was actually fairly simple. And I put this in quotes because it's obviously not simple. But they wanted to create a system of physician education that can rapidly adapt to new knowledge, technology, and capabilities and be responsive to the public's needs. And this was really the first time that the ACGME said, you know what, the public is really demanding that we assess competency in a different way throughout graduate medical education. And so they developed this complicated scheme, but this is how it stands in GME training for cardiology. We have program directors who obviously set the curriculum and the standard within individual training programs. We have updated guidelines called COCATs that tell program directors what is needed in a fellowship training program. And of course, we have the ABIM and the ACGME also giving us sort of some boundaries as well. You have your hospital-based GME training program. We'll talk about the curricular milestones, which are brand new. And then later, we'll talk about reporting milestones. So what are these curricular milestones, and how do they incorporate into our COCATs? So COCATs 4, the fourth rendition of the core cardiovascular training statement, which is developed by the ACC, really with leaders within cardiovascular training programs, was published two years ago. And if you haven't taken a look at it, it's changed quite a bit. And it really is the dictionary as to how to train a cardiovascular <coughs> specialist these days. The differences between previous renditions, COCATS 3 and COCATS 4, are that in COCATS 4, they really embrace the six ACGME competencies, much more than before, especially the four lesser known competencies. There's an emphasis on ambulatory, preventive, longitudinal, and team-based care, transitions of care, chronic disease management, and such, the things that have evolved over the last couple of years. They added critical care cardiology training and multimodality training in imaging. They talked about different formats and to, and to how pay, uh, trainees can engage in research and scholarly activity. No longer is it you have to publish X number of papers, but how to engage trainees early. It contains clearer definitions in terms of levels of training. In fact, most of which does only includes levels one and two. It's rare to achieve level three in a standard three-year training program. And importantly, for the first time, it aligned itself with the in-training examination and the reporting milestones. So you should see much more fluidity between the ACC training statements and the ABIM and the ACGME. And this is the wheel, if you will, of COCATS 4 relative to what's expected in the core areas, certainly some of the imaging modalities, and then the longitudinal care, both inpatient as well as outpatient. And I urge you to take a look at this. It's now two years old, but it really is part of what we do and how we in, indeed trainee, train trainees at the, these days. And if you look at COCATS, there are some of the old in terms of numbers of procedures. It's expected that fellows in training, if they wish to achieve level one, will do 75 transthoracics and then moving on to levels two and three. There are, is sort of this old school of let's at least define competency in some ways by the number of procedures. So I'm sorry to say that for the fellows, you still need to achieve these numbers. But it's more than that now. It's more than that to deem someone competent to say that you've done 75 and therefore I'm going to put the seal of approval. Now we have what are these competency statements. And these are complicated. They're in JAC. They're published uh, as individual statements. But this is one example. And this is really the difference between previous COCATs and the COCATs that we have now. So this is the example of COCATs for echocardiography. Yes, you need to do 150 echoes to get level two certification, but these are actually the competencies that you need to achieve in year one, year two, year three, or if you're going to be an additional fellow for years three, four, sorry, for four or five. So for example, yes, everyone needs to know the physical principles of the ultrasound instrumentation to obtain images. That's basic first year. But if you look at the second year column, perhaps here, know the Doppler findings of cardiac ischemia and infarction complications of MI. We expect folks to know this in year two. Okay, and then in year three, perhaps some of the postoperative complex congenital heart disease. So it's tiered, but indeed, it's expected that the fellow learns this and is assessed on this during their training. As you move through the competencies, that was medical knowledge, this is patient care. 
after 24 months, you're expected to know certain things in echocardiography, and then as an advanced imager and beyond, your levels of competency, your level of knowledge needs to increase. And it doesn't stop there because we need to incorporate, incorporate the other competencies, systems-based practice, pra practice-based learning and improvement professionalism, and communication. So each of the domains now in COCATS, in addition to listing standard numbers of procedures, incorporates this curriculum. And it's the first society that's really taken this on to say, we know competency is much deeper than what you get on an examination or the number of procedures that you do. And if you think about this, I'm going to show you a mirror image of this in lifelong learning that we're all being held accountable for. So we've talked about the level of uh, competency evaluation, program directors, COCATS, ACGME, moving up to those curricular milestones. Now, for the first time, we actually have to report competency to the ACGME on an individual fellow level. It used to be that the fellowship director just said, you're competent as a group. Now we actually have to show to the ACGME that you are moving up the level of competency as you go through your first, second, third, and fourth year of cardiovascular training. You at least need to be competent. That's the floor. The ceiling is much higher, but you at least need to be competent in uh, the uh, eyes of the fellowship pro program director understanding those curricular needs. So how does this work? Well, you have trainees, you have our faculty and program directors and others that are looking at the trainee either directly or indirectly, getting feedback from a variety of people, including 360s. And then Larry and Robbie and other, uh, and other folks in the program actually fill out this complex system. There are 23 competency statements that are for each fellow, but <coughs> focusing on medical knowledge and all the other competencies and scaling it. And the idea is that the competency committee meets about each individual fellow, reports these milestones twice a year, and you need to show progression over the course of a year and over the course of training to the ACGME. Understanding that, again, it's not necessarily true that everyone's going to finish training at three or four years. Competency varies, and the evaluation of competency should, should show that. If the average learner at Emory uh, cardiology finishes in four years, there may be other types of learners as well. Those who establish uh, competency earlier, those who are per perhaps a little bit slower, and then perhaps some that need some remediation over the course of weeks or months. But this is now what's expected, and the ACGME wants this feedback twice a year. And these are what are called the reporting milestones. Any questions about GME? competency evaluation in GME. It's far different than what we grew up with. And I think it's still an evolution, but there are now some hardcore training tools, including the <clears throat> training examination, as well as these competency statements that we're all being held accountable for. Yes? Can somebody finish his fellowship You can. You can. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. So let's move on to lifelong learning. And you're going to see a lot of similarities in terms of how we assess competency in lifelong learning, meaning after fellowship training. So it's complicated, right? Instead of the ACGME and your fellowship training director, we have other ways of assessing competency and other boards and other uh, governing bodies, if you will. And it gets quite complicated in terms of the rules and regulations for how to assess ongoing competency, how frequently should you do it, and who should be assessing your competency. So the rite of passage, if you will, after fellowship is to achieve certification. And that certification is outside the hands of fellowship, outside the hands of the American College of Cardiology, and is in the hands at the present time of the American Board of Medicine. As you know, cardiovascular certification is there to enhance the quality of healthcare by certifying both medicine as well as subspecialists to demonstrate knowledge, skills, and attitude. So they're a certifying organization. Certification does not confer the privilege to practice medicine. Your privilege is given to you by your hospital and your state. But most hospitals and state require that the ABIM certify you. And again, the examination is the certification process, at least as it stands now, after you complete training. So the ABIM administers the certification process by saying, 
there are certain requirements that you have fulfilled. You're assessing professional credentials of the, of the candidates. You're ensuring clinical competence. And as you know, they, you sit for uh, at least initially a one and a half day examination. There are also subspecialty examinations. It's not over just after general cardiology. There are exams in EP, interventional, heart failure, and now adult congenital heart disease. You have to show certification in internal medicine, and you have to maintain certification in cardiovascular medicine for the subspecialties. And as you know, it's not just the ABIM who certifies individuals. Now the societies have gotten into this, certainly for areas such as imaging and vascular that are not necessarily part of the ABIM subspecialty examination. So again, a rite of passage, we've been there, the fellows will get there. This scheme, the content areas and the percentages are identical to what I showed you in the in-training examination. They haven't necessarily changed, although there are some ideas that perhaps they might a little bit, but the relative percentages, the examination as it sits now is in four multiple choice question sessions, each 60 minutes long, and then as you know, there are newer ways to assess imaging, whether it's cath imaging, MRCT, multimodality, and it's quite a complex grid that one needs to go through. It's not answering just one single question. And this portion is on day two. But overall, the bar is set, I would say, reasonably low. If you look across the ABIM evaluations, both in cardiovascular disease as well as its subspecialties, they're actually a little bit, the, the scores are a little bit higher than you will see in internal medicine and in other domains within the ABIM. So these are data from 2016 work, working backwards. General cardiovascular disease, 93% pass rate for first time takers. It's pretty good. And then if you look in some of the subspecialty areas, uh, perhaps a little bit less, with EP being the hardest test, at least across the board. So that's the certification examination. Again, a rite of passage taken a couple of weeks to months after the, uh, the GME program is finished. One typically needs that to become a staff member, and one typically needs that to get certification or uh, the, the ability to practice within your hospital or your section. But more importantly, how do we maintain the tools? How do we maintain competency the day you finish that evaluation, that examination? Is that competency need to be evaluated the same way at five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, perhaps or particularly if your practice patterns have changed? The traditional tools of assessing competency over time have been your state licensure every year or two. I don't know how it is in Georgia. Your hospital reappointment, they look at how you've been doing, the evaluations, your patient feedback, et cetera. There are quality metrics, whether you're in the cath lab, EP, or in, in other areas your assessment by your supervisor. Sometimes societies get in, involved in terms of assessing your competency over time. And of course, we'll talk about maintenance of competency or maintenance of certification traditionally brought forth by the American Board of Internal Medicine. But it's not necessarily true that just because you attained competency that you are maintaining competency. And this has become a very volatile issue over the past couple of years and something I'd like to address and think about how we can move forward in terms of content, constantly thinking about maintenance of certification or competency. And I think the public is demanding it. We as patients are demanding it. And if you think about it, other industries assess competency or ongoing competency in different ways. And perhaps we can learn from those other organizations. So the typical and the traditional way of assessing competency over time, over one's <laughs> lifetime, has been built by the American Board of Internal Medicine. And when they built this, it evolved, but it evolved into four parts. First part was making sure that you maintained your professional standing in your local area, in your state, in your hospital. There was a big emphasis on self-evaluation of medical knowledge. There was part three, which was a cognitive expertise and secure examination to make sure that in a setting uh, a closed book setting, you actually could indeed pass an evaluation. And then part four evolved numerous years ago, which was a self-evaluation process, which actually is on hiatus right now, but was a way to come back to your local practice and even integrate your patients and other quality metrics to see how you're doing in your own practice. And as you know, this has evolved over time. So in, before 1990, for those who took the ABIM certification, 
there was a uh, grandfather era. You didn't have to recertify. Once you passed after training, you were done. And perhaps some folks in the room were considered grandfathers in this respect. From 1990 to 2006, they evolved into a recertification process, saying for those who actually established their certification after 1990, there was every 10 years going to be an examination, a closed book ex examination in a uh, setting just like the first examination to reassess your competency, if you will. And then in 2006, they said, you know what? In addition to the 10-year examination, we want to have continuous evaluations going on every year or every two years called maintenance of certification. So at around the time of around 2014 or so, uh, there was recognition both by the American Board of Internal Medicine as well as others that perhaps something needed to change. So this is a quote from the ABIM. There is growing recognition and agreement from the public, consumer groups, and medical organizations that assessing knowledge and performance every 10 years is not sufficient. And so in 2014, they changed it yet again. What they said was that board, certifies, certi board certification refers to pass passing the initial certification examination. But they changed the criteria and they changed the definition to now call this meeting maintenance of certification requirements. And they continue to have an examination every 10 years. And this meeting of MOC requirements changed in terms of how many points you needed, how many, how many um, different educational offerings you needed to participate in over the course of that 10-year period. But this sparked a huge debate in the literature and everywhere in terms of what actually did certification mean? Was this 10-year process worth it? It costs a lot of money. And how do we actually assess and deem someone competent? And as you know, Paul Turstein and others actually decided to go against the ABIM. No one had ever said, actually, what are you doing and how is this actually helping patient care? The public demands more of an overt uh, way to assess competency. And as a result, the ABIM took a step back, I think because of a lot of public pressure and a lot of pressure from physicians. And this is an email that I received in 2015. Dear Dr. Kuvin, everyone in this room probably received it. We got it wrong. We're sorry. What we've been doing over the past years may not have hit the mark, has been expensive, and we need to reevaluate. So what I'd like to show over the next couple of slides is how from February 2015 to October 2017, this is evolving, perhaps not fast enough, but the fact that ABIM now is open to changes, I think is going to affect everyone in this room in terms of how we are held in terms of looking at our own competency. So since then, in 2016, some major changes have occurred. This part four, which was an individual assessing our own ability to practice and looking at quality metrics, bringing in patient data, et cetera, has been put on hiatus. And a lot of us who went through this, it was a painful process to actually upload the data to the ABIM. They said, you know, we're not going to do this for now. So it's on hold. Second of all, the diplomat's maintenance of certification status on the website has changed from meeting MOC to now participating in MOC. It has to be an ongoing process. The ABIM recognized that it's a lot to keep up all of these testing every 10 years, et cetera. So they reversed what's called double jeopardy. You no longer need to maintain your general cardiology certification to keep up your subspecialty boards. So you actually don't have to keep up internal medicine. You don't have to now keep up general cardiology. You have to focus on the advanced training, if you're, sorry, the advanced certification if you're part of those groups. And they decoupled the initial board examination from the maintenance of, certi of certification. You won't lose certification if you're not enrolled, actively enrolled in the MOC process. So big changes. I don't think any of us would have thought that the ABIM would have been flexible to change things, but is this enough? So there have been a, there have been a lot of uh, people that have been involved in terms of helping the ABIM see from the clinician's eye, from the public's eye, et cetera. Harlan Krumholtz uh, chaired what's called a vision for certification in internal medicine and its subspecialties in 2020. You can see the list of individuals involved in this task force. 
And on the table now is, should we replace the 10-year examination with ongoing assessments of knowledge and competency? Should we focus on cognitive and technical skills? How do we know you can actually feed that wire up the, up the catheter or not now 10 or 20 years out? And how do we link in MOC with continuing medical education, which our state and local boards want to see? How do we actually work all this out? And where are we now relative to the 2020 vision? So this is actually where I want to bring in this idea of competencies back to lifelong learning. The competency statements that have evolved over the last year and a half in lifelong learning are very similar to those that I showed you in the GME space. And thanks to Eric Williams from Indiana and John Halpern from Sinai and the crew looking at this, we've developed competency statements for almost every area within cardiovascular practice. The practice after training, whether one year out or 30 years out, what is expected by card-carrying cardio cardiovascular specialists. So this is how they look. They look very similar. Even the color coding is the same. Very similar to those competency statements that I showed you for fellowship training. So this is echocardiography, lifelong learning competencies. What's expected for all clinical cardiologists, if you're calling yourself a cardiovascular specialist, or for those specifically focused in that practice domain for imagers, if you will. So all clinical cardiologists should know the limitations and indications for a standard echocardiography. But not necessarily all clinical cardiologists need to know the potential artifacts that confound an echo examination. All cardiologists should know the skill to review an echo image, image. But not all clinical cardiovascular specialists out in practice need to necessarily know how to do it anymore. So you could say, well, the bar is set kind of low, or it's set in a, in a sort of intermediate area, but it's meant to be across the board. All cardiovascular specialists should have at least a level of understanding and ability to take care of a patient across wherever you're practicing. So a cardiologist in Georgia should be able to practice the same way as a cardiologist in New Hampshire. And not only are the two most commonly thought of competencies, medical knowledge, and patient care involved, but the other competencies are as well. I put another example up here. This is medical knowledge for heart failure. So Andy, this is for your, for your group. All cardiovascular specialists should have a basic understanding of cardiovascular pathophysiology in terms of heart failure. But only those selected in those who are calling themselves heart <coughs> failure specialists should really dive in deeper and know more of the neurohormonal or molecular pathways and the diagnostic and management strategies. Again, going on to the other competencies, these are for all of the domains, not just echo or heart failure, but for each of the areas. Systems-based practice, again, all clinical cardiologists should know this. Practice-based learning and improvement, interpersonal communications and professionalism. <clears throat> and these are out there. These are published. The public understands them. The ABIM understands them. And we as cardiologists need to adopt them and understand that these are out there and perhaps we're going to be held account, or not perhaps, we are going to be held accountable to these competencies. So that's where we are right now. This is a summary of assessment of competency and cardiovascular training on the top. We talked about the ACGME milestones. We now have ACC curricular competencies for each area. We have ACGME program requirements, we have a new COCATS, and we have the in-training examination. That's how training trainees are evaluated at this point. We then move on to ABIM certification, the one-time certification examination to make sure you pass that bar. And now we're into this space of lifelong learning in the areas of assessment that we just talked about. State, and licensing, state licensing and hospital credentialing looks at uh, a physician now post-GME post training, continuing medical education. We have maintenance of certification programs and now we have these competency statements published and in the public domain. So where do we go from here? And what's the future of the next steps, particularly in this maintenance of certification world? So this is potentially a next step in terms of training. And I think you asked this question, are there paradigms for shortening training or for changing the paradigm in terms that it has to be a three-year training program? 
So this is a pilot project which has been going on for about the last three to four years. A collaborative project, one of the first of its kind between the ACC and the American Board of Internal Medicine. Actually saying, you know what, perhaps internal medicine doesn't need to be a full three years. And we could utilize the third year, perhaps the uh, less utilized year, as a blended year. Focusing on developing the cardiovascular specialist within the third year and then moving on to training for two, three, or four, four years. Importantly, and the paradigm here, and why we were able to get this moving along with the ABIM, is that this didn't look at time-based training. It looked at competency-based training. And the assessments after years one, two, and three were based on were they fulfilling those ACGME slash ACC competency statements over time? Years one, two, three, and then in evolution. This has been going on for the last three to four years, co-sponsored. It's been quite successful. It's at five institutions. The residents are taken early uh, outside the match into this blended third year at their same institution. And importantly, they're doing just as well as the tr regular trainees on the in-training examination. What we don't know is how they're going to do on the American Board of Internal Medicine training and how they're going to do later on. But this is a paradigm to take away that defined period of time and to let it be a little bit looser and perhaps utilize some of the time within internal medicine. Internal medicine programs don't like it because it takes residents away, but perhaps it can spark uh, training earlier on. And one goal is to actually develop general cardiovascular specialists, not subspecialists, but general cardiovascular specialists uh, in a more rapid pace. The MOC world is much more complicated. Uh, and if you've been following the literature up till last week, um, it's sort of going back to the drawing board. What the ABIM expects, what the American College of Cardiology and other societies expect, and what the public really expects in, in terms of certification. I think we all in cardiology realize that our societies should probably not be certifying us as cardiologists, and it's good to have an external body for certification. But there's been a lot written as to who that body should be, how much it should cost, and how frequently should that maintenance of certification process be. About a month ago, it was uh, publicly announced that the ABIM and the American College of Physicians were actually teaming together. And they were actually going, especially with the American College of uh, Society of Clinical Oncology, to create a new pathway of maintenance of certification. That would be an every two year evaluation by the society in collaboration with the ABIM. A whole new paradigm, utilizing the clinical knowledge and expertise of a society, teaming up with the ability of the ABIM to stamp, seal, put a seal of approval or a stamp of approval as certification. And you're probably gonna see this evolve with other societies like the ACC and others, where there will be some other pathways that will not necessarily have a sit-down, private, tenure reevaluation within uh, for, to deem yourself as a certified tenure uh, graduate, if you will. How this will be paid for and who will pay for it continues to be an ongoing discussion. These are the present fees for maintenance or certification. It's no small amount. And again, this is under much scrutiny in terms of is it worth it? And how should we be paying for this over five or 10 years, um, whether you're in medicine, a subspecialty, or some of the subs? So the way I think about the future in terms of assessing competency is, first of all, I don't think we should call it maintenance of certification. I think it should be called maintenance of competency. And we have a lot of tools now and some that are going to be evolving to let us assess competency over certification. You're going to start to see new testing paradigms or new ways to assess competency which are not as fixed as a 10-year examination. I think you're going to see a lot more focus on the training competencies when you're in training and the lifelong learning competency statements which continue to be updated over time as you continue on through your practice. We need to teach the faculty about these competencies and to teach, in a sense, to the competencies instead of teaching towards an examination. We need to make sure that there's quality improvement in education 
and that there continues to be or more of an evolution of evidence-based research in education. If you look at research in education, particularly in cardiovascular disease, there's a paucity of data to suggest whether we're doing what we're doing is good or not good. We need to make sure that each individual has a way to personalize their education and their ongoing competency. We've talked about evaluation tools. How can we document what each, what each of us have done to make sure that we're labeled as competent or not? And then we need to make sure that we continue to evolve and innovate in terms of education. I think education should continue to be a lot more interactive than it has been. Innovative, multi multimodality education, whether it's in person, online, or even point of care education. So we have a lot of room for improvement, and I'm hopeful that you're going to see new paradigms, especially in collaboration with certification bodies like the ABIM. So I'm going to stop there. We have a couple of minutes for questions. You may have sparked some ideas, or uh, if you want to add to the controversy of what the ABIM has has brought up in the last couple of years. But this is an evolution, and I think the way we think about it today is going to be quite different than the way we're going to think about it in 10, in 10 or 15 years. I will close by saying that there is uh, a potential pathway in 2019 that you don't necessarily have to do the 10-year examination. There may be a pathway within the American College of Cardiology to do other ways of assessment of competency, just like the ACP and the American College the American Society of Oncology have presented. So there's a lot of excitement out there. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks for your attention. All right, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, any questions, comments? Um, Robbie? Jeff, thanks. Uh, Robbie Williams. Um, I, I first wanted to for uh, shedding or showing a spotlight on the complexity of the program director's job and the indispensability of the program director to the institution at large. I, I just want to sort of make a comment. You sort of uh, touched on this a little bit, sort of the inherent paradox of the, you know, the milestones and the whole competency base, which I, I tend to agree with. I mean, I think, I, I think it's been good. It sort of changed the way we think about our learners and how we evaluate them. But you know, so, you know, if everyone's sort of learning on their own curves and you show the different curves, yet we have this fixed amount of time that we have to train everybody. And so how, I mean, I think in the future, whether there's going to be some uh, ability to make the length of training more flexible and make that easier. I mean, as, as you might imagine right now, it's very difficult to extend someone's training time and even more difficult to shorten it. Um, but sort of your thoughts on that is, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think in the perfect world, we would be able to, like the program director would be able to say, all right, look, I think in 30 months, you'll be, you'll be good to go. Another person might take them 42 months, et cetera. So you bring up a great point, Robbie. Uh, and thanks for your service to this institution with Larry. It, it is a thankless job. Um, I think we're just think, beginning to think about this. Not only do we have a fixed number of spots, but we also have a fixed amount of money, right, Bob? You can't necessarily say, we'll just prolong someone's training for a couple of months or years, and we have money to do so. We don't. But I think that uh, if you think about it, most people are going to fall into the paradigm of three or four years. It's the ones that really are the outliers that you have to think about. Uh, and I think we do owe it to ourselves and to our public and our community to make sure that just because someone finishes in three years, if they're not competent, that we don't just graduate them. We have to make sure that we have remediation, time and money to do so. The faster learner, I think, is much more complicated because they may be fast learners in one area and perhaps not even know or be competent in another area. So I think it's an evolution. I don't think we're ready to say that it's up to you as a training director to say, okay, whenever you want, you can graduate or not graduate. But we got to start thinking that way because it's much more about what people know than how long it takes them to get there. And I think we've, we've already graduated from the idea that maybe there are certain numbers of procedures, but it's not just based on numbers. It's got to be more than that. So, so I guess in my, I have a comment and a question. What the comment is, is the, is the shortened training experience, has that experiment's been done, right, with research track, right? We have people here that do two years, and many institutions do, so that experiment's been done. The, the second is, is where's, 
where's scholarship and academic medicine in this? I mean, the, you know, and I realize the ACC has a large component that is not academic medicine, and I think we all know that, you know, that's been a constant sort of battle with ACC. Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm a little concerned about, you know, you know, where research scholarship and, you know, opportunities for education development all fall into this. Because if the goal is to shorten things, then that says, okay, this is the minimum requirement and out you go. Versus those that maybe are the extra special that are doing better, gives them extra time to do other things. So, um, I'd like your thoughts about that. You know, it's a great point. <laughs> In terms of the, the pilot program, it's the first one that's really focused on clinical training early as opposed to research training early. So the paradigm is a little bit different, but you're right, short tracking has been around for a while with basically a couple of years of training in research and then two years of training in clinical. Um, in terms of uh, your second question, <laughs> it's a lot more complicated. If you look at COCATS 4, they have redefined scholarship. And I think it's to be more inclusive, to say that scholarship can be in the form of a lot of different things, presentations, even local presentations or presentations within your group, but to get fellows more involved in scholarship and maybe to lower the bar, but to broaden it further. I think there should be, and I'm sure there is here, an emphasis on scholarship and publication and, and research. But I think you're right, the ACC has thought a little bit more broadly that well over 50% of graduates are going to go into practice. We need to make sure that they're fulfilling all the curricular requirements. There are curricular requirements in research and scholarly activities, but the definition has changed. Numbers of publications or what defines scholarly activity has changed. So in 2025, I think it's estimated that we'll have a shortage of 90,000 primary care doctors and 60,000 specialists. So what are your thoughts about, I know the blended program sounds great, uh, how are you going to keep up in that even that year comes around with our national requirements? I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of folks now want to go into sub-subspecialty areas. As you can see, the growth of EP, interventional cardiology, structural, adult congenital heart disease. You're right, we have a growing need for general cardiologists, not so much in the cities, but in rural America. Uh, and it's, it's going to be difficult to necessarily pinpoint which direction things are going to go. I think the market's going to help drive that. Uh, the number of people uh, who perhaps are going to EP has changed over the years because of the market. Um, and hopefully it's going to be needs-based. But you're right, there's going to be a huge shortage of general cardiologists out there. There already is. I don't know if the, if the training paradigm is going to change, perhaps a little bit with the blended year to get uh, general cardiologists out there a little sooner, but I don't know if this paradigm is going to change the number of generalists we have overall. You're, you're right, it's a thankless job, but I want to thank you for doing it because <laughs> it's very difficult. The ten, 10 or 12 years I spent at ABIM, during those days, it was a total firewall between ABIM for testing and and everybody else for teaching. And that's all getting getting blurred together. The last thing I worked on was the COCATs. And we talked about all this competent stuff. And, and I was in charge of the cath lab uh, part. And all we could come down, finally we could, yeah, but when you get through, how many, how much time do people get to spend in the cath lab? How much on echo? How much? So it is very difficult to sort that out. But my question has to do with, if everybody is no longer has to be competent in internal medicine, you don't have to be competent in cardiology. You just have to be competent in in uh, in uh, echo or something like that. Um, sh should the training reflect that? In other words, should should the graduating interventional cardiologist be more than competent in in interventional cardiology if, if that's what they do? Uh, since they, they're no longer held to be competent in the rest of it as they go forward. Uh, that sounds like the answer, but the, the other problem is that most interventional cardiologists practice cardiology, but they're incompetent, or they're not, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not charged with being competent. If they're competent, it's just on their own time because they don't have to. How do you address it? Uh, it's a great question. I won't go about an interventional car cardiologist being competent in general cardiology. I won't go there. But um, I think it's a great question. You're right. In some ways, we've lowered the bar for general cardiology because that's mo what most people practice. 
Um, I don't know. I think the ABIM had to succumb to some understanding with societies to say, okay, we're going to forget this double jeopardy thing because there was so much pushback from the sub-subspecialists. But you're right, if you think about a general cardiology fellow right now, most want to do an extra year. Many sit for four or five different examinations that, by the way, at this point, are going to be ongoing 10-year evaluations. How do you maintain competency in everything you can't? Um, so therefore, you need to hone in your competencies. And that's what the ACC is saying, is that you need to hone in your competencies in terms of what you do on a daily basis. You shouldn't have to go back and be tested on that. And you need to show us that you continue to be competent in those areas. But all of our scope of practice is bigger than that one area. And I think that's, it's unclear. Uh, we've, you're right, we've foregone internal medicine competency. Now you don't even have to maintain your general cardiology competency. Um, it's a great question. I mean, the way we get through it is economics. I mean, you know, general cardiology, if that's what we need, you know, well, we, we just have to pay for it. And I hate to say that for, from the perspective of uh, sub, sub, sub specialists, but uh, that, that's what we'll have to have. Andy? So in, in, <clears throat> in many industries uh, where certain competencies or skills are required, they have uh, specialty trainers who, who go in to do that, assess it, uh, that type of thing. Um, I think we kind of assume that that happens in our training programs in some ways, but as you look at this, at your own program, are you changing um, what your faculty do on a day-to-day -day basis related to the training program, or do you have ideas about where that should go in the future? I think in the cocoon of a training program, it's easier to watch fellows do what they do, patient encounters or individual procedures. I think as you get into the practice of cardiology, lifelong learning, how does one get assessed? especially in terms of interventional skills or procedural type skills. I think that's a bar that we don't know how low or how high to set. Um, are we willing as a group of cardiologists to um, have outside people come in and claim that we're competent or not, or to watch you by video do a procedure? I don't know if we're there yet, and I don't know if we have the means to do that yet. I think in fellowship training, though, yes, it's incumbent on Padarani uh, uh, and his crew to make sure that as we sign off on these fellows to be competent in different areas that indeed they've been watched, they've been evaluated, they've been assessed, not just by one person, but by multiple people. Yeah, I think in, in some of the surgical fields, I, I don't know, I heard somebody out of Michigan talk about how they would video, have outsiders review, and how that actually did improve uh, quality. It was difficult for people to go through that That's right. initially, but it, but it can help. That's right. Yeah, just a quick question. Again, uh, thank you for your leadership. And this is a great example of how really a grassroots effort uh, by yourself and Paul Tierstein and others have resulted in really a change that many thought was, was improbable. So my question is, um, are we sharing notes and comparing notes with, say, the British or the Canadians or other Europeans in terms of this training process? Having gone to medical school in the United Kingdom, I know that their training process has completely evolved, and are we interacting with them and uh, learning from some of their thoughts? I think there is some, uh, some cross-training, if you will, between international folks. I think within the United States, there's been such a variety of training uh, across, the, across the region here. We don't even have our collective stuff together. So that was first thing, is to make sure that we could, as a group of training programs, 140 or so training programs across the United States, coalesce with ABIM, ACGME, ACC, and others to actually make a standardized training paradigm with competency statements. I think the next step, yes, is to reach out into other areas and to say, how do we differ or compare? Um, I think that we could probably learn a lot from where you trained um, and vice versa. I think in terms of the United States, the ACC has taken the lead in terms of diving deep into this idea of what is competency. I don't think any other organization has done this. Others will follow. But really, we're the ones who know, I think, what competency is in our individual areas, and therefore we need to set that stage, publish it, and hold us accountable. And I'm sure the public's going to hold us accountable, too. That's great. Thank you very much. It was really an excellent grand round. Thanks, Eric. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.